Welcome everyone. I just recorded a dialogue with my friend and colleague Philip Niklas on some of the questions that he left on a video of mine on Heidegger and Hegel. And we get into the commonalities and the differences, of course, between the two thinkers, but also the reason why they must respond differently to what there is, which is a much more crucial question and the scholar question of the scholarly question of uh, comparative similarities, etc. It's the meeting place between the two that we are after. And I'd also like to mention that Philip is teaching a Hegel course. And if you'd like to know more, then just follow the link in the description of the video. Thank you very much indeed. Welcome, everyone. I am joined by the great Philip Niklas who is a headmaster of Hegel science and logic. No, Hegelian science and logic at Helkjorn Guild. Philip, it is an honor to have you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Niederhauser. It's yes, it is an extraordinary pleasure to be here. <laughs> it's, yes. It is doctor indeed. Uh, very kind of you to mention. On a recent video of mine on Heidegger and Hegel, you commented the following. A riveting discussion, Johannes. Very well done. And I have <laughs> many well questions yes, which we yeah, <laughs> you should have had. This is like you should have had at least one paragraph of just empty, you know, empty <laughs> idle uh, uh, catchphrases of praise <laughs> because the rest of the comment is actually just you highly it's just you're just destroying the whole video, aren't you? So this was on high. I'll, I'll keep that in mind for next time. Thank you. So here, I'm, so you, I, I'll read this out. This was on Heidegger and Hegel on time and openness. And you say, the first question, how can death be an almost possibility that can never be actualized? Well, to, to quote you, you actually write actualized. So there's, oh. there's a bit of a you know, misspelling there. And this, anyway, uh, that is a yes, that, that makes the whole question invalid. It actually does. Uh, I guess there's this oh, video has come to its end. Thank you no, very much for coming. And drop it next week. <laughs> we'll move on to the next question then. <laughs> Are you? Is there any spelling mistake? No. But it, so I'll say this again. You say riveting discussion, Johannes. Very well done. How oh, that is a contradiction in terms. That's the second sentence after that. So, anyways, you say it's a contradiction in, ter in terms of possible. That's a contradiction in terms in terms of possibility, and so not a possibility. <laughs> How does Heidegger deal with this? Enlighten us. I've got a few things to say in the word Möglichkeit and the English possibility, but well, um, what I have in mind is that if something is, as I understand it, like if we say something is never possible, then it's no not possible to begin with. So that that's what I meant with the contradiction bit there. Uh, but you probably have something else in mind. No, no, so go I, on. I, we, I'm, yeah, yeah. I am. I stand ready to be enlightened. Um, <laughs> no, no, but me, maybe say a bit more on 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 a Hegelian or also maybe a traditional understanding, metaphysical understanding of possibility. Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, so Hegel has a as an account of, of, of the modalities in his logic. And he sort of divvies up the, the modal terms in terms of their uh, pure or formal status or their real status or their absolute status. And um, the pure um, status, you could say, just deals with the category itself on its own terms. So like, okay, possibility, Simpliciter, so like pure possibility, possibility, full stop. Well, okay, what is that? How can something be only possible? Well, if it's only possible, then it's never going to be actualized, and so it's not really possible. Um, so that is how he sort of thinks about it in the pure terms. But all this means is that uh, the, the modal categories are intertwined with each other. So when we speak of a real possibility, um, that is already something determinate, and so it involves an element of actuality built into it already. Yeah. Okay. And, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Does he, I mean, does Hegel make, or you, 
make a distinction between possibility and potentiality? Hegel does not. No, um, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's to, that's how I understand uh, the little I've read of Hegel. Okay, so there's no distinction between, or at least not to our knowledge at this current point, between Möglichkeit und Potential. Um, and by the way, I mean, I've got the, I think you've got the same one. I'm not sure which one this is, but you have a green book. Is this the minor? Uh, the, 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 Philosophisches Wörterbuch or hello, this... hello. Ah, uh, you're okay. Now you're back again. What do I have the same one of? Is this a minor minor Verlag Philosophische Wörterbuch or is it Kant? Oh, the things up there. That's all Kant and some Hegel. Ah, okay. So, for example, so the 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 Philosophische Handbuch or for Wörterbuch, to my knowledge, they don't make a distinction between potentialität or potential really and, and possibility or möglichkeit either. Um, mm -hmm. And doesn't Hegel say somewhere that wirklichkeit is höher als möglichkeit? This is a paraphrase of mine, but this is something, um, something that in fact I think uh. he does say, yeah? I don't recall it at this right off the top of my head, but it does sound like something he could say. Yeah, it makes sense that he would say it like that. Yeah. Uh, I think this is in the good old uh, logic. Um, and now for Heidegger, Möglichkeit is no longer a modality. That's what we yeah, have. I guess that, that I guess that's the big difference. Yeah. Um, and there is something, so what he says in the beginning of being in time in section seven, I think seven A, which is on phenomenology and explaining the term phenomenology and the method. Um, the quote is, höher als die Wirklichkeit steht die Möglichkeit. Higher than actuality stands possibility is usually the translation. So there's a an, almost an it, it, I don't think it's just an inversion of the of a, of the Aristotelian or scholastic schema, um, and it's already also beyond the modalities. And it's not so it's not possibility either. The way in which Ivo de Gennaro has tried to translate it, which that translation has its limitations, also is likeliness, um, because there is something in Heidegger uh, where you. He will say later on that the design, das Sein, the being, is das Mögliche. So it refers back to the the verb uh, mögen, which is to like, to love, to be open to. Um, maybe to be open to is most important. By the way, check check Grosucki, who you know, also from the German idealism course. He suggests the translation occasion for Möglichkeit instead of possibility. Um, but I think in, in being in time, and by the way, if, if this is all too scattered or so, just stop me and say, can you stop <laughs> and say it again? Um, the, I've used, so the usual translation is that death is the almost possibility of Dasein. And then he says, which gives Dasein nothing to actualize. Um, and it is connected with your next question, which is the question on horizon. But I will say this, maybe. So um, the way in which this is introduced is that there are, there are factical possibilities for Dasein in everyday existence, right? One of them is that if you fail to show up to your seminar at Warwick, which you teach because you're ill or... You don't, be, you don't know, you have to do something else. Then I can, you know, some degree, I can stand in for you. Um, and so there's a there's there are possibilities of, of replacing rep representation, etc., all throughout everyday existence, except for 
death. This is, in a simplified way, this is what how Heidegger introduces death as a possibility. Um, there's, there's, basically, you could say that it's, it's, um, it's hundreds of possibilities, uh, in, in, not in unlimited, but uh, an unquantifiable uh, amount or so of possibilities that uh, are always open to Dasein. Um, existentially, not purely in terms of logical modality. Um, and one of them, as introduced, is, uh, is death. But that's the one which gives, which is not, no one can die your death for you. No one yeah. can stand in your death for you. So it's introduced in that sense as a um, possibility but then shows itself as the analytic of death or the existential concept of death develops, shows itself to be, um, well, it becomes an impossibility of existence. Why? Well, precisely because, maybe, because there is nothing to actualize, because there is nothing that... Um, so it, it loses the character, you could say, of a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's an existential ontological, to use that term, understanding of the possible. So maybe what, what we could also say is that it's the, I don't know if this does anything for you, but is the almost way of being open to oneself is found in a most radical to go beyond how to get a most radical acceptance of one's finitude and death does that make any more sense mm -hmm. yeah uh, well it sounds a lot of what like what hegel has to say about finitude right yeah. the hour of their birth is the hour of their death it's yeah. just in your character that's that there is an end built into because you have begun yes. and uh, this is not something you can think in terms of escape or not escape because you wouldn't be without this kind of structure um so which you embodied yeah um but but then i have a question if i may about uh whether um, whether Heidegger sees uh, kind of death as a phenomenological um, event or something like in those terms, or ontological uh, structure, does that does that make sense? What I'm trying to ask. Yeah. yeah. Here? Okay. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Maybe say a bit more on how you would distinguish between the two. So because okay, like. You know, in every day talking about these things, one can suppose that, um, you know, you have a fear of death, you have a fear of dying and, and all those uh, all those things. And um, this can be a, an, an impactful thing one can have. Maybe one gets very ill and one feels like, holy shit, I feel like I'm losing my, you know, my my presence to myself, my self-conscious, etc. cetera, right? Um, uh, and nonetheless those things can be very abstract, right? They can be something far in the future or they can be near in the future, but nonetheless, they are kind of like projections, kind of like ph phenomenological um, effects. Uh, is that something what Heidegger has in mind when he speaks about death or is it more on a kind of philosophical? Okay, what's ontological here for you? Well, it wouldn't really do anything to change your experience. It's, it's just a, f a part of the fabric of reality uh, of which you are part of. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> so both, <laughs> but we have to be careful because uh, this is why I wanted these um, clarified phenomenological and ontological. For Heidegger, um, 
phenomenology proper is ontology. Not so, I think, for Hegel. And this is why it is through the everyday and the everyday speech you described, um, oh, you know, the a fear of death, etc., cetera, um, that Heidegger arrives at the, as you put it, the ontological structure, which then is death, which is the directedness or stretching itself out of Dasein towards an utmost limit, or its utmost, it's das äußerste, the most, um, the es not eschaton, <laughs> but um, the most extreme, the most out there. It's a limitation from which, and this is, by the way, also important. So um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Hegel is ich philosophy. It's a philosophy of the I, of the ego, not of the ego, but of the I, of the ich. And Heidegger is a return to Welt philosophy. Um, and what Heidegger is after is, and this is where they meet, is the overcoming of the subject object dichotomy. But as far as I understand Hegel, there will always be subject and there will always be object. They just show themselves to be at moments identical and then again separated. For Heidegger, this distinction between the dichotomy that opens up with modernity is only possible on the basis of what is Dasein. And Dasein is, if you like, the ultimate, is, is the being of the human being and is the way in which um, the world, Dasein is another name for um, openness, for the understanding of being, is another name for uh, being in the world. Um, and the world itself unfolds as a background. So it's not a totality of things, right? Which is, I guess, what world would mean for Hegel still, more or less. But it's a background against which beings appear as meaningful. And that may be so to, to clarify, because one of the questions is, I have difficulty with the idea of horizon. It seems very murky to me. Can we give a logical explication or is it synonymous with possibility? Can we give a logical explication, please? I want to, I want to have the science. So um, give me the science, give it now. Give it here. Okay. Okay. I, so I can actually perhaps in a certain way um, give a, and I, I have published on this, <laughs> I've, um, a, a, an existential logic, if you like. The world disclosed. So there is, there is no givenness, and I think this is sometimes where. And as you know, we have we have a common teacher, uh, and and um, what Holgate says about Heidegger is that there's a givenness in Heidegger, and that's not the case. But I, I understand why a Hegelian reading must assume that, oh, this is all given, and now we're just working our way through what's already given. No, the world discloses ex negativo. Hello? Yeah, was I gone again? No, 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 you're there. I heard you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, world discloses ex negativo. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to get my notes out now because I want to be, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. And uh, I guess um, yeah. I would like to hear more about what uh, disclosing uh, ex negativo means. Um, yeah. Well, what would it mean for, for you? Well, uh, it sounds to me like you, you comprehension is mediated or that the understanding whatever it is that you're trying to understand is something um, mediated. Uh -huh. Why? Because it's not given. Or like it's, I'm ex negativo, it sounds to me like it's inverted or in its negation, if I understand it correctly. Yeah. 
Go on. So, yeah, so I presumably yeah. you you do have givens, but the givens are negated. So you are you are looking beyond the givens or you're looking over the givens. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I'm I'm uh so what's given for you? What what do you mean by given? By the way, one thing, because I forget, as you mentioned before, the hour of the birth is the hour of the death. Heidegger quotes from a text, the Ackermann aus Böhmen, the farmer from Böhmen, uh, where, where the text says, and Heidegger quotes this passage, which is, um, as soon as a man is born, he's old enough to die. Sorry, I just wanted to mention that. So, Yes, very fine passage, yes. Okay, what is given? Um, given is usually what's um, what's there and what's immediate, what has being. Um, and being usually comes in many different flavors. It comes in uh, distinct objects, things you perceive, things you have cer certainty about, sensuous certainty, things you feel. Um, and it can be even ideas you might have. You know, You might have a sudden idea about going for a jog later today. Call that an idea? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a determined possibility. There's a notion, perhaps. Yeah, anyway, go on. I mean, yeah, I'm not using the idea in this technical sense here. Ah, yes. yes. Forgive me, forgive me. That's not that. You're not forgiven. Go on. That's too murky. I'll just give it back to you. Go on. No, sorry, go on. <laughs> No, and that's it. That's nothing more to add with the givens. I mean, the okay. whole point is that it's simple. Uh -huh. As simple. Yeah. All right. So here's what's strange about the, the, the text in Being in Time. And it... Heidegger's piece of formale Anzeige, not, not, it's not really carved out or anything with the formal indication so there is something in say um the way in which the human being qua dasein is in his or her everyday world and the example that's often used is the, the hammer in the in the um in the carpentry in the workshop where the hammer is usable it almost it seems you know it's present is ready at hand to hand not present at hand, that would be what I, if my bicycle breaks down, then I have to make it present and uh, vergegenwärtigen uh, in a very different way than just using it. So there's less of an immersedness with it. And all of this is, sim in simplified terms, that, that's the first division of being in time. And these are, you, we, we can almost, um, we, collects phenomena but the book it's but the text itself is after something else entirely which is how do we understand so how can there be this kind of pre-theoretical understanding of being what would a theoretical understanding of being look like and ultimately what he wanted to write at the time is a fundamental ontology fundamental ontology which is grounded in the care structure of dasein and then what he does, all, also already in the first division of being in time, is actually to take everything away. And this will be radicalized with death. In angst, or usually it's translated as anxiety, uh, there's a complete negation of care structure. That means there's a complete uh, negation of sense. There's no longer sense. Um, there is all kinds of handlungsorientierung, your orientation of action, etc., is negated. So you could understand angst as a logical negation. And it's only then through this negation, though, that the full sense, as Heidegger says, of the world shows up. So it's not this pure immersedness and the readiness at hand and look at me using a hammer, blah, blah, blah. It's when meaning sense breaks down or is negated that um, there's, a, you know, and that's even more radical in death, where all possibilities are suspended. Um, and then by 
well by by you could i think you would probably say by negating that negation um dasein comes out into back into the world again but then fully you know and the distinction of course here is between inauthentic and authentic which you could say there's then um could say a mediated immediacy no longer a, a sheer immediate or a, what's the worst thing for our hegelian is a medi- no uh, an immediate mediacy right that's what you don't want a what i'm sorry um, uh, immediate mediacy and an unvermittelte vermittlung an unvermittelte gegebenheit an immediate givenness uh-huh well uh, we can work with that it's fine <laughs> the worst thing for us is just something is what it is yes and that's so <laughs> it is what it is is what they always say in the uk um but uh what 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 shows it's uh, you could say is uh, is that the phenomena are ontologically they're, they're precisely uh not as they appear but the but the way in which heidegger approaches this is already almost what he will become to be called Seinsgeschichte later on which is poorly translated as being or onto historical but let's just say it for now um, in the sense that the way in which we understand what it means to be now, even completely unquestioned, is as presence at hand, or in another way, is as availability, as givenness. And that itself shows itself to be, uh, it doesn't stand up. That's what being in time shows. Is that the, if, if that were the mm-hmm. case, it would collapse. And it's actually only through collapse which is which happens in anxiety and even more in death, that the genuine authentic being in the world arises. So Dasein has to go through, in a Hegelian sense, its own self-negation, as it were. Yeah, but can I ask then the 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 level of the present to hand and all of these things? Do they break down on their own, or is are they being negated from the outside, or is like you know is it? a dismissal of that sphere or is that something about that sphere that dissolves on its own terms um okay i think it it's it it if well it depends on who you ask i guess but uh according to the word uh for dr niederhauser um the way i which i would understand uh, angst and anyone's interested the paper is published in Perspektiven der Philosophie um, I'm not sure if I can find it now is that this so it, it's not as it were this is an this is a different language this is an inner process so it doesn't have to be negated from outside I think that's what it shows it's, it's nothing with the world the world itself shows itself to be nothing would that make sense what would it be yeah. like for hegel? what would it be like would it be for hegel it has to you i have to negate them no no the, the things negate themselves yeah but they prove themselves to be moments of the concept uh-huh and the concept is what you can say is, you know, thinking, comprehension, what have you. And that's the kind of the structure that informs our experience, our thinking of anything. Yeah, yeah. But thought deploys itself in immediacy, in its implicit form, in its more basic forms. Because um, that makes a lot of sense to do it like that. Why? <laughs> right. Well... Um, otherwise it would just be absolute and fully explicated from the get-go at which point we wouldn't be here discussing anything we would just be like divine mind knowing everything at all times well you know we're getting (laughs) close enough aren't we you know all things considered (laughs) no um yeah, but Hegel doesn't need to posit that idea. Kant needs yes. that, so something like that. He needs, Ooh. you know, um, intuitive Ooh. understanding. Kant. Kant. Yeah. Kant. Yeah. 
he needs he needs an intuitive intellect to sort of contrast his own finite mind against. So yes. if there's, there's a finite mind, there must be an infinite mind. Yeah. But hello, I'm not infinite, so it must be this beyond thing out there. Um, but for Hegel, is um, no, no, no. Let's not let's not posit that thing. Let's not make that assumption. Let's just work with what we have, what is near to us, and see what unfolds. Yeah. 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 Yeah, very good. I mean, so, um, so I, I, um, for anyone who's interested in paragraph or chapter 40, which is in German, die Grundbefindlichkeit der Angst als eine ausgezeichnete Erschlossenheit des Daseins. That's usually translated as something like the fundamental state of mind of anxiety as a, uh, ausgezeichnet, a remarkable or some or distinguished resoluteness of Dasein. And that sounds like there's a fundamental state of mind of anxiety, which is understood as psych in psychi psychiatric terms, sorry, which is then a distinguished or a special way of being resolute in the world as a Dasein. Dasein is not a homunculus, right? Uh, we're not dealing with Dasein. It is not a thing or not a human being. And Heidegger says later after being in time, it never occurred to me to think of Dasein as taking the tram and using fork and knife to eat. So the way in which just to translate maybe even in German, but to, to translate this, it means the Befindlichkeit is finding oneself. There's a fundamental finding oneself or finding itself of angst which is a distinguished unlocking or disclosing of Dasein. And Dasein, of course, means also existence and being there in which the human being participates. So um, there are differences. We're not, we're not trying to say Hegel and Heidegger are saying the same thing, but they are. So what Heidegger is decidedly, I think, not saying is that everything is given because what Heidegger is after is to think negativity, infinitude more radically than Hegel. Um, and precisely, he never has to go to an external, how did you put it with Kant, mind that... Uh, a divine mind, uh, you know, yeah. uh, intuitive intellect. So, and he says, for example, that angst achieves something, namely, um, it, it achieves to, well, to let's collapse uh and of course you know it's completely different because it, we're talking here about attunement and mood which for heidegger not subjective and for, for hegel these are logical movements or processes right um angst is a is a logical movement no 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 i mean for for hegel the collapse of things that's a, a necessary dialectical logical movement yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and of course, this is not the case for Heidegger. Um, this is what I'm trying to say, because angst or anxiety is an attunement of Dasein, a being attuned, which doesn't mean I'm in a bad mood uh, in my subjective inner world, but it means that Dasein itself is always already tuned or attuned in a certain way and therefore disclosing world entirely differently. So it's, yeah. Yeah. I, I wonder if the, um, the place to sort of um, connect this in Hegel would be in the philosophy of spirit, where yeah. stuff like feelings, habits, um, intelligence, um, emotions, uh -huh. etc. Those those things become, I don't know, you know, come out of the logical development there. Yeah, and, and Heidegger, you could say, to some degree, grounds the insights from German idealism and it's a, some of the aporias of Kant and Fichte and the way in which then Hegel moves in, has to move into dialectics and, and negativity in the existential ontological and um, where, so it's, but it's precisely not to say it, that the, the presence at hand, for example, that, that's given, but that's, a, that's an ontohistorical understanding of being that's now prevalent because of Descartes, 
in which there is no death, there is no finitude, there is no limitation to simply, I mean, this is a bit exaggerated, uh, but the, um, what is, uh, and, and, and you could say that um, perhaps that the, it's, it's the, uh, the everyday mode of the they, the they self does man, that turns away from angst and anxiety and turns away from this a necessity of letting the world collapse, which is it's, so. Um, yeah, so I, I have a reading of this, which is no, which is not existentialist or so, right? But it is. It, it as soon as we are in angst in in being in time, we are dealing with um, the ontological. So and and. I think what what what's um, uh, so this is also why the nothing comes up right in the before what or that's uh, for the angst I don't know the the off what of anxiety or what anxiety is afraid of is the is the nothing it is nothing and nowhere becomes obvious so we're moving into nothingness also. Yeah. Holy shit! It's nothing. Well, but it, uh, but it does. No, but it doesn't <laughs> stay there, obviously. But um, so there, there is a it having gone through everyday phenomena in angst, the, the nothingness of the world or of the world is not of the world as an object, but world itself shows itself in this developmental stage as nothing. And then, of course, ends up in, doesn't end there, but moves on to history. But it's, yeah. all I would say is that if any any reading of, of Heidegger, it says, oh, there's, you know, the positivity is givenness, etc. I think it doesn't take into account what death and angst really mean. Yeah. So okay. go but you go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 So uh Hegel does speak about despair and doubt when one enters into philosophy and says it's like almost like a routine event or experience that one has or one must go through in order to um almost like discipline or prepare or or go through kind of trial with one's own mind one's own thinking in order to then you know do philosophy but once you it's like growing pains right once you make the threat you cross the threshold and you start doing the philosophy then despair and um doubt and on and those things they're the most more emphatic things they they they're not relevant in the analysis or the, devel the logical development, so to speak. So I wonder if, if in Heidegger, angst and and things like that are are continue becoming uh, being a uh, relevant moment in the thinking, or if it's more of a sort of uh, preparation for philosophy, you know, to grasp being and what it entails and so forth. Well, no, that I don't know how to respond because there's several. I mean, so angst or anxiety is is not mentioned anymore in the so-called later Heidegger of the contributions, 1930s and onwards. Um, so in some sense, one could say it was preparatory for his own thinking path. But we should also be careful not to conflate this angst in its most fundamental sense. It's a hermeneutic key to unlock the nothingness of the world rather than any contingent subjective mood or so or feeling 
or a state. It's not a state that one is that one is literally in. It's you could say that in the ontic experience of a fear of death, or, the, or what psychiatrists would call anxiety attacks, which which very often mean the, you know, the world is opening up and you fall into an abyss, right? The, the, these these reach down into the ontological. Yeah. Uh, but th th there's there's something else that's spitting. By the way, I think Schelling said, abandon all hope in order to enter. Okay. Isn't that, that's Dante, isn't it? That's a Dante's Inferno. No, no Dante says, uh, lasciate ogni speranza voi entrate. So let go of all hope, ah. ye who enter. But Schelling says, in order to enter philosophy, you have to let go of all hope. Um, it's the Dante year, isn't it? 700 years. Um, this year, so um, it's so and and, and uh, well, the horizon, and then we'll move on maybe to the next one. Um, is is the limit against which well, you could say almost that horizon is another term for for world. And horizon is against which Dasein projects itself and its projects and throws itself into the future only to come back to where it is now. Um, so it's not synonymous with possibility as your question continues, but it is. Um, well, let's say a horizon. Can I, can I ask something? Yeah. Um, would there be a horizon without Dasein? Nine. Okay. Yeah. I think Kant and Hegel would agree. Just like there is no history without Dasein. Yeah, not really, no. <laughs> no. But, but, like, yeah. but, but like for Hegel, uh, even our idea of, of nature like let's say the natural world, right? Yeah. Doesn't doesn't exist on its own. It's we who who gather the those physical um, phenomenal things and project also put them together into a concept of world. But the world as such doesn't isn't isn't there. Which is a strange thing. Because we at at the once unify things into a world, but then also see ourselves as apart from that world. Yes, yeah. And hiding in in, in in I mean look look what's what's I think what probably wasn't overlooked at so was overlooked or ignored or not seen at the time, uh, but then maybe briefly was seen, uh, but now isn't anymore, is that what being in time wanted to achieve is I think to become the summa theologia of its time similar to the logic and to the encyclopedia. Um, of course, you know, you could say we are the categories, etc. but the attempt is to write a foundational, fundamental ontology so that this, and as he makes it explicit, so that the sciences, biology, anthropology, physics, etc., medicine have a common grounding. You see, he's a child of the crisis of the sciences. He's a, yeah, Dilte and Husserl and Nato, also two of Heidegger's teachers. Everyone's on about the crisis of the European sciences at the time. Nato explicitly says that the tower is already falling. We are wading through a field of ruins. Um, and this is what Heidegger is trying to achieve also with the book and many other things. But yeah, the horizon is not given and it's not there without the human being you could almost say that the human being itself is qua dasein that very horizon but of course not not as a homunculus and anything that can be reified but only as and this ties to your next question as the living understanding of being and that means and that means it's not given because it with every new birth the question arises again um, and it, it's, as you said before, you know, if, if it all were given, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't need to, we would be all knowing and we would 
be outside of time or so and overlooking the temporal unfolding of the world from a non-temporal stance. That's not the case. It's precisely because it is temporal ecstatically. So an ecstatically means it's not linear, it's not circular. Uh, there are weird waves going back and forth between the dimensions of time. And I saw today that actually already Hegel speaks of dimensionen der Zeit in the encyclopedia. Um, in this sense, Dasein is living understanding. But I think your question here is, if Dasein is living understanding qua universal, then perhaps this aligns better with the subject in Hegel or the logic of subjectivity. More work needs to be done on this front, like the milit militaristic. Oops. Yes. <laughs> okay, then give it here. Now tell me what's because we have to be careful because obviously the subject is for Heidegger that's the enemy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. What what is the subject no, for Heidegger? No, tell me first, please. What 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 had motivated the question? What do you mean, etc. And then I'll say a few words. I've been speaking a lot. Yeah. Okay. Well, subject for Hegel means fundamentally that um, that what is the case in the world, what is the case in being, isn't just being or substance, that there is a sense of, well, we understand that whatever we think of materiality or of nature and so on, there is a part of that that thinks of itself. Right, that thinks of itself and puts itself in relation and opposition to its surroundings, but and also tries to think the whole of its surroundings. That, I think, for Hegel, in a kind of nutshell, is the subject, and hence why he says multiple times that's uh, like an way we have to think about things is not just as subject, I mean substance, but also as subject, which means that there is a kind of fundamental shift in the being of reality, that it's not just natural things doing their thing, not knowing they're doing their thing. You know, when a, when a cat is hungry and comes to you for food, knowing that it has done this many times before and it is meowing and whatnot, and you give it food, it sort of reifies the kind of uh, instinct that it has or whatever, but it doesn't know it, right? Um, the subject is is the kind of and um, is of the kind of being that knows itself in doing something or pursuing something or knowing about things. It knows it's uh, knows itself in knowing about things, and that Hegel thinks is a fundamental shift and is not identical with natural world um, and the givens. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't make sense. There's, 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 there's a way in which that, in in which this connects, but, but only to some to some degree, and then it Heidegger completely breaks away from this. Uh, is that you, you, you put it better than I will be able to repeat it now. Something to the effect of that you have, there's not just reality, but there's the way in which we respond or interact with it or think it. Uh, and then also, you know, in terms of natural science, classify, et cetera, et cetera, uh, has use, I think you said, has an effect on, on what there is on reality. Is that? Yeah, very crudely. Yeah. So you cannot think of, reality as just something posited by thinking, but you have to include thinking in reality. So reality itself is thinking. Um, so for Heidegger, the, and this goes well, way beyond being in time, but the understanding of being, it's so let's say with being in time is not given either. There is this vague pre-theoretical understanding, but that works itself through Dasein historically yes but that doesn't mean it's just given in fact it must be critically questioned for its presupposition that's what the book is trying to do um 
for the later Heidegger, you could say that, and this is where this meets, um, is it's all about the way in which the, the human being um, responds to the modes of being's dispensations, you could say. So the way in which the human being responds to the challenges of Gestell, which is a way of um, ordering the world, either uh, in reinforces the powers of technology and technological enslavement and technocracy, etc., or uh, disempowers them. So, just as a or 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 is also the question of how we how we are with Earth or with nature, with animals, and etc. Right? If if we think of this is Heidegger's example of uh, of nature as a standing reserve as a resource then it, nature becomes a gas station um and it, that can come we become cars <laughs> what well, the human being becomes a computer you know etc you know whatever however we, we conceive of ourselves now um this is yeah as you know this is alienation 101 uh in for Hegel. But here's now, and this is where um, this breaks with, with Hegel. So Hegel is the first one who probably after Fichte fully realizes the threat of subjectivism. Fichte sees it, as you know, but Hegel tries to overcome the subject object dichotomy while maintaining that language of subject and object. Now what Heidegger does is to look at the etymology and the translation of the word subject and, and the question why the human being becomes the subject. Subjectum in Latin means that which underlies. Um, that's a translation by the Romans into Latin from the Greek to um, which is sometimes in Aristotle, depending on your translation, also translated as substance, for example. But it's that which underlies, and then you've got, in a crude scholastic sense, accidents, anything that comes accidentally as a quality to it. Well, yeah. But what Heidegger says is that the, the, the bottomlessness of, of the Occident begins or opens up when the Romans translate without having made any experience in thinking, any genuine experience in thinking, without just translate the word toy Pokemon on as subject. And there are many, many such cases, as it were. And that's one of the main ones. Um, and now we could talk about, you know, the, this first simulacrum of through words, etc. But maybe that's leading us too far astray. In modernity, the human being becomes the subject par excellence. And that, to Heidegger, is, in his critical philosophical project, one of the main issues and questions. How is it that the human being becomes, then, therefore, the bearer or the ground of objects in their objectivity? And the first response is that that's possible because of Dasein. It's always been Dasein. So yes, Dasein is not a universal, but Dasein is in the early Heidegger, you could say, a, a principle. Um, and the, um, the, the uh, <clears throat> but the human being is to be dethroned from this position that it has assumed for itself. Okay. While still, while, huh? Um, okay, so please go on. No, no, you go on. You said why? Did you say why? No, maybe I said okay. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> well, um, I, I'm, I'm just wondering how, how that how that is done. Um, how subjectivity can dethrone itself. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Without actually, without still retaining 
it's high position because because you can say you know it's uh subjectivity is not the end all it's not the that's not the ultimate it's something else but then it's still subjectivity positing that so how do you ever get out of that sort of reflection loop so to speak you see what i mean um yeah i do go on perhaps that gives you more time to think <laughs> okay yeah so i i, I think I, uh, I get what you mean with the whole subjectivity issue going yeah. from fichte to hegel and that fichte saw i mean hegel saw and fichte that uh, you, if you all if all you have is i and the i posits the not i and then you have the relation then it seems like a you know, it's almost like a solipsism. It's just within itself. It just revolves yep. within itself. Yep. <laughs> but for Hegel, that that cannot be ultimately the case. So he thinks that what's really going on is always a kind of relationship between subject objects. So um, sometimes the emphasis is placed on the object, sometimes on the subject, but fundamentally, they are both part of a um, common. Uh, relationship or recipro reciprocality and that is just what he calls the idea yeah <clears throat> okay so the question is of course does does the subject dethrone itself um, yes <laughs> for heidegger probably no and this is then where, you know, but when this, and this is where we have to leave behind um, like any kind of scholarly approach to this. Uh, and also this is not about, oh, but Heidegger got this wrong and Hegel didn't understand this, but for Heidegger, something shows itself to Heidegger which is what he refers to as Ereignis. Um, and you mentioned the idea. So the Ereignis is decidedly not the idea, but the idea is as it were of the Ereignis. So what begins to show itself to Heidegger is that, and this is by the way, this is what shows itself in Gestell, in techniques and technology, if you like, and the essence so-called of technology, or let's say the realm that technology opens up, is that the, 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 so the early Heidegger says that, you know, subject of dichotomy would make sense only if it's predicated on Dasein, but let's forget about this for now. So the later Heidegger, it's that, um, is that nature does not show itself. And so let's say that the language of the 19th century that described nature no longer holds up to the way in which we are now in the world. Um, <clears throat> objectification doesn't begin to be able to describe to the ontological uh, shifts that occur in modern technology. Uh, and, and Heidegger only mostly speaks, of course, of, um, I mean, he didn't see the internet yet, right? Uh, but Hegel didn't even know the radio. Uh, and Hegel didn't know the car, as far as uh, I can tell. Uh, and for, for Hegel, the machine is uh, just an autonomous um, continuation or progress or development of a more primitive tool. Um, but for Heidegger, the, that, that language of that time can no longer describe where we are. But we should also watch out for the language that we're using. So for example, Hegel speaks in the encyclopedia of virtuelle Möglichkeit, the nächtliche Schacht, the Bilder, the, what is it? the nocturnal shaft of images, um, which is uh, consciousless images that are saved. I mean, you know, listen to this language. In, in our 
in our intellect. Um, and those are virtuelle Möglichkeiten. So in some weird sense, and this is perhaps where you, you, you think, what the hell is he even talking about? Uh, <laughs> maybe not. So there's in some strange sense, the language of metaphysics is manifesting itself in the technological world. Even just the word cybernetics, for example, right, which is kubernetes, steering, etc., from ancient Greek. But at the same time, also that language that still was able to describe human relations and human interrelations with animals, plants, stones, etc., no longer holds up today because we have a completely different uh, way of. There's a, the nature does not even if it's the most crudely objectified um, in say the 19th century, simply doesn't become uh, a completely quantifiable, well, gas station is, is the, the, um, the placative, I don't know what the word is in English, um, way of saying this, but, So, okay, I'll say this oh, maybe. Stop me anytime, okay? Or interject anything. Um, but the, the language for Heidegger no longer holds up. And so my question is this. That scholarly, you know, we can forever say that you know, Heidegger says this and Hegel says this and this is where they're different and this is where they go together. And he's right, but that's where he's wrong. Or if there is something genuine that has that has occurred to which Heidegger responds because he comes a bit later than Hegel doesn't mean that Heidegger is more right than Heidegger uh, Hegel but that perhaps something has shifted in say being or whatever that we must now find a different language a different way of thinking in order to respond to what now is or if not then we're stuck in the eschaton uh sitting forever in our zoom meetings and fighting over how to describe reality if that word even makes any sense anymore yes yes absolutely <laughs> hegel says you know it's the one's got to understand one's own time in thoughts that is what philosophy is right and so both hegel and heidegger you know in some sense uh, are no longer speaking for us we need to speak for ourselves but they can still teach us how to do that and how to get, you know, get to a certain point. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, for, I, I don't like, you know, the big, big contention for Hegel is, is determinism and freedom, I think. So an object is defined of, of the thing that is fully deprived of self-determination. It's what it is, is dictated by other objects, right? So, how it's determined is given to it from the outside and it doesn't care about those things. So we can treat nature, uh, a lot of things in nature like that. And we might get somewhere along those lines, but that might also reflect back on us and how we treat each other. Um, but fundamentally for Hegel, there is a kind of philosophy of nature, such which means that, well, implicitly nature has a logic of its own. And uh, it's because it has a logic of its own, has um, a content, uh, uh, a direction, an impulse, uh, doing stuff on its own that, that, that allows us to understand that and then to uh, exploit that. We're not doing anything to nature that nature sort of already doesn't do to itself. Um, but I think uh, Hegel would worry when we start applying that kind of logic back to our, upon ourselves. So we become now objects. We become now tools, things to be used, etc. Yeah. Um, and this, and the question though is also, so where, where do they stand? You could, say that and Hegel is firmly within 
the metaphysical tradition. The science of logic is a, is a profound memory of the categories of what we can refer to as metaphysics. And the question is, and this is where it gets spooky perhaps, but is what Nietzsche poetically proclaims as the death of God, uh, etc. It's perhaps a closing off, however, of a dimension, which is the metaphysical dimension, <clears throat> and a shifting over into a complete, and this, I think this is what Heidegger is after, and he's, this is all he's trying to say after being in time, is trying to articulate that which is inevitably coming, which is a completely different way of understanding what it means to be, which some, in some weird way, is born from the metaphysics of old, but which no longer speaks to us. And by the way, Hegel himself is already also aware of much of this, I think. He says in the introduction of, to the phenomenology that this, our time, is a birth time. And this boredom and silliness, and he speaks of the diremption of spirit uh, in the in the Differenzschrift on Fichte and Schelling, and in the signs of logic, as you know, in the introduction to the first edition, Hegel says that the metaphysics of only 25 years ago doesn't speak to us anymore. Where the question was, you know, does the soul exist? Um, does God exist, or is God immaterial, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Hegel is also aware of a certain collapse. And also, by the way, he very often speaks of the Niedergang der Philosophie, the, the decline of philosophy, and that that entails the return, the, the rising of uh, an empiricist um, association of ideas and representations. So not thinking, but just associating um, images, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, what is a decline of philosophy is not just that the discipline ends, but is that world access is reduced. Ac access to uh, being, if you like, with Heidegger. So, um, but so the, the well, I just say, the project that, that I have is not to compare Hegel and Heidegger, uh, who cares, you know, but to, show that they're, they're, they're one of them on the utmost edge and the other one already outside of it but looking back um, are one of them trying to hold up something while the other one sees this is perhaps for some reason no longer possible um, trying to describe world being meaning let's say nature um, so that so that and this is the the, the decisive distinction between Heidegger and people like Derrida and this, uh, not to deconstruct and say this was all nonsense and all wrong uh, or just genealogies, not genealogy, because no, but to to main, but to maintain what's um, worthy of of maintaining, and then as you, I think you said it yourself, to articulate for our own time um, what is in our own language. But, but learning from them, of course. Yeah, well, whether or not we like it, we are a product of them. And it serves us to be aware of those things and, you know, uh, be, be aware which debunked thinker uh, one is prescribing to. Yeah, and, and, and that has to do for Heidegger with, with the work, workings and weavings of time. Um, one of your questions is, what is eternity for Heidegger? And I'll say just one word. It's the past. <laughs> I should write that down. I have to think about what that means. Is it what Deleuze calls the pure past? I have not read Deleuze. <laughs> I have... The Guattari, I don't know where it is. The the Thousand Plateaus. Yeah. Unreadable gibberish. I can't read it. Gives me headaches. <laughs> Gives me tremendous headaches. Uh, well, thank you, Philip. Thanks, Johannes. This was great. <laughs>